so welcome again. Our guest today is clinical psychologist, Dr. Michael R. Edelstein. Uh, Dr. Edelstein is a protege of the famed uh, cognitive, cognitivist and uh, mention, Dr. Albert Ellis. Uh, Dr. Edelstein is in private practice and has written four books. Uh, my favorite of the sections that I've read of the books is the three minute therapy. Is that what it's called? Three minute therapy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because it's revolutionary. Uh, traditional psychotherapy involves years and years of analysis and rehashing of childhood traumas. And I, I actually told my children to research their previous lives. So this way, if they have any problems in this life, they can blame a mother in a past life. But, <laughs> you, know, yeah. I, you know, I think it's, it's good that, that, <laughs> yes. that, that you, yeah. are, you, are, you are focusing on the present. Right, and right. I, you know, that is so appealing. Yeah. So Dr. Edelstein's topic today is DIY therapy for abstract thinkers. And I hope you'll also touch on some of us who don't three think that abstractly. Yeah. Well, welcome anyway. It's so wonderful to have you here, Dr. Mike. Right. Yeah, it's great to be here. And uh, thank you so much for helping. And I remind you all that, that uh, Dr. Mike would, is, is happy if we uh, interrupt his talk with any questions, either in the chat to everyone or by raising your hand and saying that then that the way you do that you go down to the bottom and it says reactions click on that and you'll see at the bottom raise hand so you click on that and we will recognize you yeah and uh, the meantime, will yeah. you be the one recognizing people who have questions in the chat i can do that okay that would be very good okay and uh Otherwise, uh, I ask you all to stay muted uh, until you uh, have the floor. So now we have 16 participants. Welcome, Susan. And uh, other people I don't see right now on the other screen. So, okay, without further ado, we will give you the floor, Dr. Mike. Welcome. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks for helping set it up, Roberta, I appreciate that, and arranging it. And as you mentioned, uh, the approach I'll be discussing, the DIY approach, I learned from Albert Ellis. And my first uh, exposure to Albert Ellis was at a Mensa meeting in New York. I was uh, about 16 or 17, I went to a talk of his, and I was in, uh, more conventional therapy then for about a year. And it really wasn't helping me. It, uh, I, I had a very warm therapist and I told him about all my weekly problems and he was very accepting and kind. So I felt good uh, during the session, but he never gave me any ideas about how I could work on my problems. So all I could do when I had problems during the week is look forward to our next session. So that didn't work very well. And um, I went to the uh, Albert Ellis talk where I first saw him with my sister and brother-in-law. And my sister immediately started to see Dr. Ellis. And after about six months, she said to me, you know, you're not getting anywhere in your therapy. I suggest you see Dr. Ellis yourself. And I did. And that dramatically changed my life. So that he not only created a revolution, a revolution in the psychotherapy movement, but he helped create a revolution in my life. So, uh, so of all the people that have influenced me throughout my life, I'm most indebted to him. And he died in uh, 2007, but I'm still friends with his wife, who's a practicing therapist, Debbie Jaffe Ellis. Uh, now, 
I'll be discussing his approach called REBT, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. So that's what REBT is. And it's based on one fundamental principle. And I often bring my clients back to this, which is our emotions do not come from situations, as most of us believe, and most of us in the world believe. And if you listen to people, they'll say, well, I'm anxious because I have a deadline at work. Or I'm angry because this crazy driver just cut me off. But that's not how we work emotionally. It's no crazy driver that can get into our gut and churn it up and force us to feel any emotion. And it's not deadlines at work that could force us to feel any emotion. The wonderful message here is it's always your thinking. And if you don't like your emotions, go back to your thinking, change your thinking. Uh, so that's the do it yourself basic message and I'll apply it to different things. So change your thinking if you don't like your emotions. Um, and you can try to change the situation as well. But you generally have more power over your thinking than you have over most situations. As the Stoics tell us also, and REBT is based to some extent on Stoicism and Buddhism and the work of Al, Al, uh, Alfred Adler and um, Karen Horney were some of the main influences in Albert Ellis's life. By the way, Albert Ellis, in addition to my book, Three Minute Therapy, Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life, which Roberta mentioned, Albert Ellis has written over 80 books. So, uh, so and many of his books is on Amazon as well. So that's another option in terms of reading. And he also has some YouTubes. So you can even see him and see how he came across. Um, now, so child our childhood is irrelevant to our emotions. As uh, Roberta mentioned, most therapists believe, let's get back to your childhood and see what went wrong. Your uh, overprotective mother and your critical father, this is why you have problems. But that's not the case, it comes basically from our thinking. In terms of influences on our emotions, now there's a difference between control and influences. We control our emotions, they come from our heads, and we have the power to change that. But we do have influences, and our childhood is an influence, our genes is an influence, our, the milieu we find ourselves in now is an influence, but the control and the cause is our thinking. So it's important to differentiate between influences and causes. Um, now, so the first step is, what's my thinking that's causing my disturbed emotion, anxiety, depression, anger, guilt, or disturbed behavior, procrastination, or addictions? What's my thinking? And uh, our thinking is that causes these problems is in the form of demands. Must, shoulds, supposed tos, have tos, demands we put on ourselves, others, or situations. For example, if you're feeling anxious, depressed, or guilty, most of the time, not all of the time, it comes from a demand on yourself. I some form of, I must do well and get approval, and if I don't, I'm no good. So it's self-downing, putting yourself down, and that comes from a demand on yourself. If you're feeling angry, hostile, or resentful, that normally is a demand on someone else because you're angry, hostile, or resentful toward them, and that takes the form of you must treat me well, fairly, kindly, courteously, reciprocally, reasonably. And uh, that, so that's a demand on others. And if you don't, you're no good. 
So rather than putting yourself down with a demand on yourself, you end with the global evaluation of putting others down that you're angry at. And then the final must, the third must is uh, not, it's an impersonal demand. It's not a demand on people or oneself, but it's a demand on the conditions of one's life. And that takes the form of life must be fair, easy, hassle-free, exciting. And that leads to uh, behavior, behavioral problems rather than emotional problems most of the time. And those are procrastination and addiction. So you procrastinate to escape the horrible life you decided you're in because things aren't, life isn't going well the way you would like. And, or you addict, your, you addict yourself. So procrastination or addiction to escape. So that's, uh, that's a basic outline. Now, this REBT is not feel good therapy. In other words, the solution isn't to feel good all the time when bad things happen. But the solution is to uh, think reasonably about it. And if bad things are happening, if they're going against your goals, it makes sense to have negative feelings. But there's a difference between adaptive negative feelings and maladaptive negative feelings. Adaptive negative, negative feelings come from preferences that cause them. And when you have a preference, it starts with, I prefer X, whatever it is. I prefer a lovely day today for my picnic. And if it is a lovely day, that's good, that's positive, and you feel good about that. But if I wake up and it's raining, then that's negative. That's bad because it goes against your goals. And then we don't want you to feel happy that it's raining when you were looking forward to a picnic. You would feel uh, disappointed, irritated, annoyed, um, feelings that don't rip you up inside, unlike depression, anger, or guilt, which does with uh, those emotions. So uh, it's important to distinguish between adaptive negative emotions and maladaptive negative emotions. Now, one thing that uh, we're very uh, likely to do because we tend to think abstractly, especially us Mensa members, we think abstractly, uh, is to create a secondary disturbance, which means a must about a must. So I feel anxious and I don't like that. So I have another must. I must not feel anxious. There's something wrong with me. I'm a nutcase. I'm a loser. I shouldn't feel anxious. And then you get anxious about feeling anxious. Or you're going to give a talk in a week and you realize you're going to you might feel somewhat anxious at the talk, and you make yourself anxious a week in advance about feeling anxious at the talk because you're thinking, I must not feel anxious at the talk. If I do, it'll be horrible. The roof will cave in and the world will end. So uh, those are irrational justifications for the must. Are there any questions so far? I don't, I think your, your talk so far, doctor, has been so engrossing. I think people are just listening to that right now. But, oh. I, you know, I mean, I certainly resonate totally with what you're saying. It's, it's so, so lovely. I see a lot of uh, thumbs up. So people agree with that. So remember that, that um, Dr. Mike, we can interrupt at any time with any questions if you have them. Please right. continue. Yes, and as you're listening to the talk, a question I want you to ask yourself is, how could I use this with myself mm -hmm. or cure my friends and relatives with their problems? Because it's very simple premises and uh, you can teach it to others without a license. I won't uh, report you to the California Board of Ethics. And uh, so 
So keep that in mind. How could I use this for myself with my problems? Another concept that I teach my clients is called the problem separation technique. The problem separation technique. And what that means is as we go through life and as we go through the day, we have various problems, challenges, uh, goals, things we'd like to accomplish. And we, and those, and our emotional reactions to those uh, are often twofold. One is feeling frustrated about the problem, uh, feeling eager to work on it. So those are, uh, those are practical problems. So for example, let's suppose my goal is to get up tomorrow morning early to get to work on time. So the night before I have a practical problem, how could I do it? Do I set my alarm? Do I ask my wife to wake me up? Do I just go to sleep extra early to make sure I don't oversleep? So that's a practical problem and practical solutions. But then being human, I can easily start worrying the night before. What if I oversleep? This will be awful. This will be terrible if, I, if I'm late to work. Uh, and uh, so I've created an emotional problem about the practical problem. Now, the reason this is an important concept is because once you've identified the practical problem, let's say how to get up, extra early tomorrow, then you use practical problem-solving strategies like an alarm clock or these other methods that I mentioned. But if you've also identified an emotional problem, I'm anxious about oversleeping, then you use emotional problem-solving strategies. Uh, and that gets back to what's my must, what's my should, that's causing my anxiety. I must not oversleep. It'll be awful if I'm late for work. It'll show I'm a loser. So you work on those two things separately. And often if you try to solve emotional problems with practical problem solving strategies, it doesn't work that well as getting to the root of the emotional problem and then thinking more clearly to come up with practical strategies. Any questions about that? Uh, I don't see any questions. Oh, uh, you have one, Lindy. Yeah. Uh, Lindy, really please go ahead. Yeah, not really a question, but just that separation is brilliant. That, that is just so helpful separating the problem from the emotion we have about the problem and i think that for many of us we we don't automatically make that separation so that's really helpful oh good good thank you Wendy. and uh you know I, I would like you to talk more of that you said that you know we can help others but is it it's very touchy isn't it because yeah uh, people yes. will find that an intrusion uh you know, I mean, for instance, I know someone who's constantly complaining about everything and uh, blaming others. He blames his wife for his poor health. And he, 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 he even went to the doctor and he said, I'll prove that it's my wife's fault. And he said, okay, here, take my blood pressure. And the doctor took his blood pressure and it was within normal range. And he said, okay, I'm going to think about my wife for 10 seconds. Now <laughs> take my blood pressure. <laughs> And of course, the blood pressure <laughs> had shot way, way up. So, but but this person is convinced that 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 he is absolutely right that it's the wife, his wife that's causing right. it. So, do you know what do you do in that situation? Yeah. Do you do you kind of just stand back and listen because any suggestions might be not taken <laughs> very lightly. Too well, but, yeah. So uh, that's an excellent question, Roberta. So uh, the way I, I respond to that is first ask for permission. I have some ideas about what might help with this problem. Would you be interested? 
So if she says yes, then you have a more comfortable entree into giving some, some of this advice. And uh, we already see what his basic problem is. He's saying his wife creates his emotional disturbance. He's not taking responsibility for it. And as long as he blames his wife, he's cooked because she's unlikely to change overnight. But he, so he has little power over her. He could try to influence her, but he has much more power over himself and his thinking. So ask for permission if you'd like to intervene with people. Does that answer the question? That's great. That's a great answer. And uh, Ed, you go ahead with your question, please. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, if, if you wanted to uh, uh, help someone uh, and wanted to just say, please, uh, maybe you profit by asking their permission, of course, first. Um, how about reading this book? And could you recommend a book or perhaps one of your books that would give them give somebody the basis of of uh, your philosophy yes definitely very good question Ed. thank you for that uh yes i would recommend i modestly think my book is one of the best around on rebt so i definitely would recommend my book three minute therapy change your thinking, change your life. By the way, I call it my book, but I've written it with my co-author, David Ramsey Steele, uh, who really made it sparkling. I wrote the draft because I'm the therapist and he went over it because he's a senior er editor at a publishing company. And uh, so it's a, it's a very interesting book as, a, as well as helpful. By the way, mentioning David, he he and I also collaborated on another of my books called Therapy Breakthrough, which details the history of the psychotherapy movement, starting with Freud and Jung, and then going all the way up to Albert Ellis and how Albert Ellis changed the psychotherapy movement with these ideas. Um, and also uh, one way that I suggest to clients to uh, suggest to friends or relatives to read the book uh, is to avoid having them think you're criticizing them. You know, you need this book, you have emotional problems. So one way I recommend if it works in your relationship is to say, you know, I read this book, Three Minute Therapy. It was very helpful to me and you're a critical thinker and I value your opinion. So would you take a look at the book and see where I was off in thinking it's a helpful book? So that's, that's an approach. Does that answer your question, Ed? Yes, and I think, I think your uh, method of introducing the book is extremely manipulative. Yes, yes, that's the idea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, manipulate them into helping themselves. Yes, of course. <laughs> Uh, okay, any other questions before I get into some specific uh, emotional subjects? And feel free, if, if you have questions, we're only about 20 people, so feel free to, to just shout out and yeah. uh, ask Dr. Mike a question anytime during his talk. Exactly. I believe, Martin, had a question. I believe Martin had his hand up. Um, Martin? Yes, yeah, so you've talked about shoulds and musts, and for me, I've learned a lot of those are really wants. Are you talking about the same thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a very good yeah. question. That's a very good question, Martin. Uh, I'm sorry, did you have more to say about that? No. Yeah, so, uh, and that's an important point in how our psychology works, and that is, Shoulds and musts often start, almost always start with strong preferences, wants, wishes, desires. So the way musts and shoulds work is I strongly prefer to give a good talk and therefore I absolutely must. I have to give a good talk and if I don't, I'm a worthless loser. 
So, so you start with a preference and escalate it into a must, and that's where you make a practical problem into an emotional problem. But another aspect of this, which you might be touching on, Martin, is that often when people say, you should do this or you should do that, they don't mean it in the psychopathological sense that I'm discussing, but they just mean it as a synonym for I prefer you do this or I prefer you do that. And I teach my uh, clients uh, something uh, that Albert Ellis called semantic precision, I call semantic accuracy, but it's uh, if you want to change your thinking and get in touch with your psychopathological shoulds and musts, then try to train yourself to just use preferences. So you should make the bed. Well, what I really mean is I strongly prefer you make the bed. So you can uh, change your thinking, change your speech in the process to train yourself to think in terms of preferences and not the absolutistic musts and shoulds. Uh, but that's not necessary. You get extra credit for doing that to practice semantic accuracy. Yes, uh, Mr. Silverman or Dr. Silverman, did you raise your hand? You need to unmute yourself, uh, Mr. Silverman, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, an observation, uh, Roberta must be well adjusted. She has a picture of flowers on the back of her. her. So, and I find that uh, Bach helps me a lot. And my wife finds doing crossword puzzle does the same thing. So does it have to be verbal or could it be auditory, these kind of clues that you, that will help you? Well, I think doing crossword puzzles or listening to Bach, which is one of my favorite diversions, Bach, Beethoven and uh, Stravinsky um, is a distraction from your disturbed thinking, but it's, it really doesn't get to the root of it. What's my must, what's my should, that leads to my stress now that I want to listen to Bach to relax uh, with. So Albert Ellis called that getting better versus feeling better. So if you're stressed and you listen to Bach and that takes you away, or you, you smell those beautiful flowers Roberta has, that distracts you from the stress, but it doesn't get at the underlying philosophy. So when the same situation comes up again, uh, you're likely to feel stressed, unless you have a Bach recording around to listen to. But uh, so the more elegant solution is changing your thinking. But uh, diversion or a secondary solution is fine. So um, that's, that's a distinction between um, an elegant solution uh, versus a uh, non-elegant solution. Does that answer the question? Sort of. So do you want to follow up on that? Uh Actually, what it does, what Bach does, it actually, I don't hear it. It's interesting. And I don't actually hear it as I would hear it as a piece of, uh, one of the composers you mentioned, I would never listen to him, but. <laughs> yeah, but, that's Stravinsky, right? Yeah, right, thank you. <laughs> uh, music ended after the uh, 18th century. <laughs> but, I can see that. That's for another discussion, but, but. It, what it does is it, it gets me to fo it actually gets me to focus on the project that I would have to do and not necessarily gets rid of all my anxieties. I mean, you can't live in this world where you have an immense uh, number of anxieties, even if you're perfectly or you're well adjusted otherwise. I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the stresses, I think stresses on on everybody is enormous. So I'll keep my mouth shut. Okay, please don't. If you have further questions, let us know. I have a question. What about meditation? Yes, the same with meditation as Bach. And that is, uh, it's a great distraction and uh, tends to help people relax. And for some people, it carries through for the rest of the day. So if you're one of those people 
uh, by all means uh, use the meditation. Don't let the perfect, which is doing REBT on yourself, be the enemy of the good. So, so that's fine. I have nothing against that. I have a question, please, Michael. Yes. Based on uh, the previous questioner, I really like to listen to books. Are your books available as audiobooks? Uh, unfortunately, my books are not available as audiobooks. You know, we were in the process of making it into an audiobook uh, with the publisher, and then unfortunately, the publisher died. Um, oh. he, had a, he was 63 and had a, a heart attack or a stroke in his sleep. So okay. um, we haven't been able to follow up on that. But if anyone is interested, or you know anyone who would be interested in making the book into an, uh, an audio book, uh, please contact me and we'll see what we can arrange. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions right now? Okay, the next uh, aspect I'd like to launch into is the idea of self-esteem, uh, particularly high self-esteem. Now, many therapists will tell you if you feel bad about yourself, you think you're worthless, you think you're a loser, you have low self-esteem, which I agree. And then the solution is high self-esteem, which I don't agree. Uh, and uh, so let me deconstruct self-esteem a bit. So self-esteem, high or low, comes from evaluating your acts, rating your acts. So I did, I won the race, that's a good act. Therefore, I'm a good person. So you rate the act and you rate your total self based on that. And there are many problems with it. Uh, one of the most obvious is it's just an overgeneralization because you do well, that doesn't mean you're good or wonderful or a hero or anything like that. It just means you did well. And one of the most worst things about high self-esteem is people tend to think more negatively about themselves than positively, not everyone, but many people. So they're, they're gonna be um, stuck in low self-esteem a lot. So what's, what's the solution if you uh, have depression or low self-esteem, or even if you have the other side of the coin of self-rating high self-esteem. <clears throat> and the solution is unconditional self-acceptance. Accepting yourself as an imperf the imperfect human you are, whether you do well or poorly, you're always the same imperfect human. Uh, and if you walk down the street and look at other people, you don't see, uh, it's not obvious someone's a good person or someone's a bad person, but it's more obvious that they may be acting well if they try to rush across the street against the traffic light and take their life in their hands. We could say they're acting poorly, but that doesn't make them a poor person. So there are no good people, no poor people, no angels, no devils, just us imperfect humans who do well at times and do poorly at times. We're a process, we're always changing. And when we do poorly, we can try to do better and sometimes succeed. So uh, that's my take on the whole self-esteem idea. And unfortunately, most therapists don't recognize that self-esteem is a trap. And I have a chapter in my book on self-esteem where I discuss these ideas in more detail in my book, Three Minute Therapy. And the name of the chapter is Self-Esteem, the Feel Good About Yourself Trap. And now you know why it's a trap, because it comes from self-rating, and then you're likely to rate yourself badly when you do poorly. Any questions about that? Anyone disagree with that idea? I mean, self-esteem is popular in the culture. It's popular among therapists. If you listen to people, it's popular among everyone. Yes. Uh, is it Mr. Silverman, Dr. Silverman, or somebody, something else? Yeah, you, you can call me anything. Call me Schmuck. Oops, Listen, uh, 
Is your book electronic? Never mind that. Can I get it on Kindle? I uh, know. Unfortunately, all all you can get it on is um is either on Amazon if uh, you don't want to spend the extra money, or in a library. Not on Amazon. I mean, if you don't want to spend the extra money, you can get it in a, in a library. Or um, when was it? What was the publication year? Uh, well, there are two publication years. The hardcover came out, the original copy came out in 1997, and the revised edition, uh, which is soft cover, came out in 2019. Mm -hmm. the, the, the only problem is I, I, I used to read books in the real stuff. I can't do it anymore. I only read uh, electronics. All of my books, I have a huge number of books, but they're all uh, with uh, electronics. I see. Is there any way if you get a book either um, online or the hard copy? I, I can get a hard copy. Into, uh, an audible book? What's that? You, I can get a hard copy. I'm sure I can get a hard copy and conceivably in my library, local library, but it's well okay you you have impressed at least impressed me to the point where i would actually give it as a gift to somebody i know who's close to me who has uh suppose an individual see, wants to seek this help but the, and uh but comes to any number of uh therapists and after a short time decides that they are not addressing their problems and they go back into their funk, so to speak, they go back into their uh, very difficult circumstances because of their, because of them, uh, their mental state, basically. How do you deal with people like that? How do you get them to actually embrace recognition of their own circumstances? Well, the first way is to ask them, uh, would you like some help? I have some ideas. Would you like some help? And then if they would, there are many ways they can get help. Of course, they could make an appointment with me or another REBT therapist. Um, and then in your case, uh, where reading doesn't work for you, whereas voice does, you can go to my podcast. I do a new podcast every week. It's called Three Minute Therapy Podcast. It's also a YouTube channel with the same name, Three Minute Therapy Podcast. And you can hear this approach applied to a whole host of problems. I have maybe 200 podcasts now or more. So it, it, uh, we apply it to various problems. Also, if you'd like some free therapy, you can be a guest on my podcast. And I do it with another REBT therapist who's very good in Yuma, Arizona, Kevin Benbow. <laughs> uh, contact me, call me, or email me. And you can find my email address and my phone number on my website, 3minutetherapy.com. I, I took your name down. You, I will visit. <laughs> you took what? I, I wrote your name down on my pad and okay. I will visit. Right. Okay, very good. That's open invitation to everyone. Visit, and if you'd like to be a guest to discuss problems or discuss helping a problem of a friend or relative, uh, you can come on and Kevin and I will uh, uh, get you on the right path there. Okay, uh, the, next, the next issue, now that we've dispensed with self-esteem, and you're all unconditional self-acceptors, not rating yourself highly or poorly, uh, is anger. Now, in addition to the, my unconventional approach to self-esteem, I have an unconventional approach to anger. And it's my conviction that all anger is toxic. It doesn't work. It tends to eat you up inside and alienate others. And if you're driving and you get angry at the guy who just cut you off, you're more likely to not think clearly and get into an accident or 
uh, do foolish things like cut him off also and get into a, a fight on the road if he's the, uh, <laughs> the pugilistic type. So uh, anger doesn't work. And also it comes from demands, musts and shoulds. And it comes from the second demand that I mentioned earlier. You must treat me well, fairly, reasonably, responsibly, uh, rationally, reciprocally. And if you don't, you're no good. And all that is fictions. There are no psycho psychopathological musts. There are no musts and shoulds just in our nutty heads. And there's no evidence that anyone has to be the way you want them to be. Uh, there is one way other people have to be the way you want them to be. And that is if uh, next week you're ruler of the universe, you're, and you run an election, you get elected ruler of the universe, and then uh, people will have to be the way you want them to be because you'll have absolute control over them. But in the real world, that's not the case. So in the real world, you're a subjective human and you could try to influence people, but getting angry generally doesn't work. Any questions about anger? Lindsay, did you have a question? I have a question about anger. Yes, I do. Okay, so who's talking, Brian? Is Brian talking? This is Martin. Martin. Oh, okay. Martin. Martin and then Lindy. Yes, Martin. Okay. Um, what about using anger as a message to yourself? And also, what about using anger as a motivation? Uh, well, normally, anger, a better way to motivate yourself is with determination and passion, because if you're angry, then again, it tends to cloud your emotions because it comes from a must and a should, and you won't be as effective as if you're passionate and determined to change yourself or change others. Does that answer the question? Uh, that answers the second one, but the first one was um, the case I feel, I, I think I feel anger. What is that telling myself? What, what is the message that's giving me? Is there something I should learn from that feeling? Yeah, well, I would say the thing to learn from the feeling is uh, you're tending to eat yourself up inside with the anger. Uh, so it would be good to not do that. But, but anger comes from a must. I must change or someone else must change. But remember, underlying all must are passionate preferences. So why not use the passionate preference to change uh, without mixing in with musts and shoulds, which are fictions anyway and don't work. So, um, so that, is, uh, that is a more effective way to motivate yourself or others. And you may really mean by anger, Martin, passion and determination, not the psychopathological emotion that I'm discussing. And Lindy? Michael, when you talk about anger, um, I, I can't remember your words, but basically destroying relationships, hurting relationships, I, I of course agree. However, um, I find I get a good feeling from being angry, from expressing anger. So is there a safe way or a, a way at all that I can experience that feeling without harming relationships? Uh, yeah, and the first thing I want to mention is it could be the reason you get a good feeling from expressing anger is because anger is... Uh, a type of grandiosity. I know better than you what you should do, and you better do it, or else I'll, in my head, I'll roast you in hell and punish you for that. So that's, uh, you might get a good feeling from that, but you normally won't get good results in terms of what's going on in your body 
and in terms of getting another person's cooperated, cooperation. And by the way, um, there are bad things normally that are happening in your body when you get angry. Your blood pressure gets raised and uh, you could, um, so that's not very good uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, a result of anger. So one way you could express your emotions or feel your strong emotions without the anger is by thinking of it in terms of preferences and shoulds. Mm -hmm. And you could say, I prefer that you do X, Y, and Z. And still underneath it, you're really meaning you should do X, Y, and Z. So it, it's not only changing words, but it's changing the meanings behind the words. Mm -hmm. that the meanings behind shoulds are, I run the universe, I control you, and uh, mm -hmm. so therefore you should do what I want or you're a bad person, whereas thinking, uprooting the shoulds and musts and thinking in terms of strong preferences means I have a good idea for you, I strongly prefer you change, but if you don't, you don't, you're not a bad person, it's not the end of the world, and I could still have a good life and be productive, even if you don't change. Is That's that right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions about anger? And uh, all these subjects I discuss, I deal with extensively in my book with a, a chapter. The next subject I'd like to discuss is addictions. And I have a few chapters in my book, Three Minute Therapy on Addictions. And uh, the common addictions are smoking and drinking, although I don't see many people smoking these days, but I see fatter and fatter people. So uh, I think there's more overeating. And, uh, and also drinking. Now, I uh, a facilitate a free meeting for people with addictions who want to overcome addictions and they're on zoom and it's called smart meeting s-m-a-r-t is an acronym for self-management and recovery training self-management recovery training there are meetings just about every night in the week uh and now that we're on zoom you could go to a meeting in florida or in san francisco and to get more information about the schedule for the meetings, go to smartrecovery.org, smartrecovery.org. There's no charge, anyone can attend. We uh, help people of all races and all economic conditions. We've had homeless people come to our meetings. Um, so that's an option, alternative. Now, normally, so to diagnose, there are a few ways to diagnose an addiction. One way is to, sometimes you're not sure if you have an addiction. So one criteria for that is if you act in ways that sabotages or blocks your goals, then we could call that an addiction or a compulsive behavior. So if every night you have a glass of wine and you're not a, having alcohol problems and your goal is just to have uh, an enhanced dinner evening with wine and you just have one glass or sometimes two and then you stop and it's not blocking your goals, interfering with your life, then we would say it's a not an addiction. But if you notice you're drinking after dinner it leads to another one and another one and another one and you wake up with a hangover and you got a d a d u i and uh then we could say it's most likely sabotaging your goals and you have an addiction to alcohol or similarly with food if you're uh overweight and you'd like to lose the weight and every morning you look at the scale you haven't lost weight, or maybe you gained another pound, then we could say you have an addiction to eating. 
And by the way, most people don't recognize this, but the most common addiction people have and most difficult to get over is not smoking, it's not heroin, it's overeating. And these days when it's easier and easier to get food laden with sugar and oil and other things like that, that may, and salt that make it uh, tempting to have another bite, uh, it's easier to get addicted, and I think that's a reason why we see more and more people who are overweight. Any questions about addictions? Okay, uh, another major problem is procrastination. And I think procrastination is one of the most common problems people have, and I very rarely hear therapists talk about it because it possibly because it's so common and they just see it as part of life and maybe they procrastinate also. So uh, that's another reason they don't recognize it as a problem. Pro procrastination is um, a way to uh, put off disagreeable tasks usually. So you find it disagreeable to wash the dishes. So you say, well, I'll do it tomorrow. And then you have more dishes to wash that night and I'll do it tomorrow. So it often doesn't work. And again, it comes from a must. And this must is, I must not feel uncomfortable. And uh, when you wash the dishes, it may be uncomfortable. It takes away from more enjoyable things in your life or it's a pain in the neck. So I must not feel uncomfortable, so I'll do the dishes tomorrow. Or something a client spoke to me about yesterday, procrastinating on paying his taxes. Again, the same must. It is uncomfortable to pay my taxes. I don't like paying my taxes, uh, and I shouldn't have to face this today, so I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, whenever you hear yourself say, I'll do it tomorrow, that's a reason to do it now. Do it as soon as possible, because I'll do it tomorrow. There's always going to be a tomorrow, so that there's always going to be a good excuse. Um, and again, I have a long chapter in my book on procrastination. I, I have a question about uh, procrastination. I've read that it's related to perfectionism. Would you agree with that? That people who, I, you know, I know, uh, uh, my son would write a beautiful paper and then he'd, he'd look at it and he'd say, oh, this is terrible. And he'd tear it up, you know, because it wasn't perfect. Yeah, that's a very yeah. good point, Roberta. So procrastination often comes, as I said, from not wanting to face the discomfort of doing whatever it is. But the secondary reason for people is perfectionism. Uh, it must be, per but again, it's a must. It's not shooting for perfection. Shooting for perfection, I would like to do this perfectly, but if I don't, it's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean I'm a horrible person. So that's an incentive to work hard. But per perfectionism means you're making it into a demand, into a must, and it takes away from uh, more productive things you could be doing. And you're letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. And so. Uh, so look for perfectionism also in procrastination. Laura had a question in the chat. Oh, thanks, Laura. Uh, yeah, I wanted to know what you could tell us about grief because I'm having a horrible time with it right now. Uh, okay, yeah, that's a good question that I went through a few years ago and my wife, unfortunately, died of lung cancer. And so, there are a few aspects of grief. Grief often is reasonable, understandable, appropriate, appropriate because it comes from a strong preference. I strongly prefer that my loved one didn't die. I strongly prefer not to have this empty space in my life right now. This is very bad. This is very sad. And uh, that's reasonable grief and reasonable mourning. But when I work with people with grief, they often have 
emotional problems about this practical problem. And that uh, is twofold. One is you turn the grief into depression or loneliness because it's very sad this person died and I no longer have this person in my life. Therefore, it's awful, terrible, and horrible. Life is a ball of misery right now, and that causes depression uh, in addition to the grief. So you have a practical problem, losing the loved one, and then you have an emotional problem, depressing yourself about that. And I'm not saying be happy or don't care if uh, someone important to you dies. Uh, do care and make that a, a passionate preference. I strongly prefer to have this person in my life. Uh, everyone's going to die sometimes, and that's very sometime, and that's very sad. And I can allow myself to feel grief, mourning, crying, missing this person, yearning to have them back. And that leads to appropriate now adaptive neg negative feelings, as I discussed earlier. So try to separate the, the emotional problem, depression and loneliness from the practical problem, which is the loss, the great loss in your life. And if you do uh, feel this great loss and you cry and you mourn and you're not uh, as productive in your life, don't put yourself down. Allow yourself to do it and don't say, I'm a bad person because I'm still grieving. I shouldn't be grieving. And I've had a few clients in the other direction that is they still enjoy a couple of things in their life or laugh once in a while after their loss. And they think, I'm a bad person. I shouldn't be enjoying my life. I should not be joking around. And uh, this shows how uncaring I, a person I am. And that also comes from shoulds and musts. I shouldn't have any positive emotions. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm a cruel, cold person. So as usual, look for your should, look for your must. Albert Ellis used to say, cherche le should, cherche le must. So uh, <laughs> always look for that. That's going to be... Uh, the underlying problem, the underlying issue with your emotional problems, not practical problems. Does that help with uh, clarifying what's going on with grief? Uh, a little, but I, I think there's like other issues going on because uh, uh, that was my only family and, and I'm now stuck with no one's there to help me when oh, I yes, have physical yes. problems. Yeah, yeah, so there are a lot of, there could be a lot of practical problems as in your life. I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, it's compounded uh, with these extra practical problems. No one there to help you and, and those kinds of things. Roberta, it's uh, a minute after three. I could go on longer. Uh, what do, you, do you want me to end it or do you want, shall we go on? Uh, we have a, a few more uh, questions, I think. Uh, so... Uh, for instance, a friend wants to know when uh, your group on smart recovery is. She said that she does not see it on your website. Right, right. Yeah, good question. It's not on my website. It's at smartrecovery.org, which describes uh, the philosophy of smart recovery, which is largely what I've been presenting and it gives you, there is a page that gives the various meetings and links to those meetings. So smartrecovery.org, not on my website. And was there another question, Roberta? Uh, I, let's see, I think that, that uh, the other questions you already answered. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, because, boy, I mean, we could listen to this all day. I'm sure people agree that this has been so eye-opening, you know, with, with each of these, you know, insurmountable problems and you just make them uh, so clear and so approachable. Uh, was, there, was there another topic that you wanted to deal with before we leave, uh, Dr. Uh, Michael? Uh, uh, so uh, another one is 
The only one I haven't, well, there are a few things I haven't discussed, but uh, okay. maybe we'll leave it for another time. Um, okay. Uh, but so, Sue did have a question. So Sue, what is your question? Uh, if I'm hearing part of what you're saying, it's um, in some cases, if there's a problem, remove the emotion and deal with the problem that the two are separate entities. Besides that, uh, what other takeaways should all of us be having from this hour? Okay, great questions. And I'm not, I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Sue, because I'm not saying remove emotions. I think emotions are very important and they make life enjoyable. I'm right. saying remove maladaptive emotions as I distinguish between adaptive and maladaptive emotions, emotions that tend to degrade your life, but don't unnecessarily degrade your life, don't remove emotions. And does that answer that question, Sue? Pretty much. Are there other takeaways that we should have? Yeah, other takeaways. Well, the main takeaway is um, when you're disturbed or acting in self-defeating ways, look for the must, look for the should, uproot it. And uh, I teach specific strategies for doing, doing that. That might be kind of amorphous, but I teach writing exercises called, I three, called three minute exercises. And I describe those in every chapter in my book, whatever the chapter is on, whether it's on procrastination, anger, anxiety, relationship problems, uh, I show you how to write uh, these three minute exercises. And just briefly, where you write down the irrational belief, then you say, what's the evidence that I must do well because I strongly, I strongly prefer it. So we're looking for empirics data uh, in the real world that it supports your musts and shoulds. Since all musts and shoulds are fictions, you're never going to find any. And then as good scientists, if we don't find any evidence for hypothesis, we tentatively reject the hypothesis. Uh, so that's another method that I talk about in some of my podcasts, but I have in every chapter of my book, Three Minute Therapy. Uh, so that's pretty much the takeaway. Uh, read my book. That's a takeaway. Another one is if you'd like to consult me, I'd be happy to work with you. Right now I'm on remote, phone, Zoom, Skype, FaceTime. And uh, unlike most therapists, if you come for one session, you don't commit yourself to any long run of therapy. And the therapy I do is averages eight to 12 sessions because I teach you to be your own therapist. But if you just want to come for one session, that's fine also. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Michael. I, I, this has been a very enlightening hour. And we thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. And thank you to everyone who's contributed and has been with us this hour. Um, all the best to you. We hope to see you again, Dr. I'd Michael. Like to, I'd like to uh, thank you, Roberta. Very good. Happy to Very good. participate. Thanks. Bye.